and the head coach of the UAB Blazers on set with us now. Coach Trent Dilfer, welcome in, Coach. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm fired up. We're getting Coach some coffee, too. Black. <laughs> black. I'll so, say black coffee. So what do you think of Birmingham so far? I love it. I don't like it. I love it. Uh, I actually went back to Nashville this weekend. It was my wife's birthday, and I was talking to some people that we hadn't seen in a while and just bragging on the city. Uh, I think, number one, I love the people. They're authentic. They're real. Um, they're friendly. The hospitality has been incredible. Um, the food. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've frequented, the, I've frequented too many restaurants too often. I've put on about 15 pounds. Um, it's beautiful now that everything, you know, I love the outdoors. I love golfing. I haven't played for four years. Um, just driving around, um, seeing the different areas. It's a beautiful city. So um, I, I've just been blown away overall with my time here. Yeah, I, I, was, I was born here, and I wanted to get away after college. And I ended up coming back, and it gets better every year. I mean, yeah. you guys are going to love it. Um, it's just a great place. And, you know, Nashville's really cool. Nashville's gotten too big, though. Yes. I mean, too Nashville, Hollywood, too. Yeah, it's, it's the Vegas of the South yeah. now. There's always something going on. It's like sensory overload. Yeah. It's a cool place, but it's too much. Agreed. And, again, my time there was great. My family's still there. My, my daughter, her husband, my grandson, my wife's kind of splitting time. So I still get back a little bit. I still enjoy a lot of parts to nashville but it was just getting too much like the california that i left on purpose so uh, <laughs> uh this is this is home for us now i love being downtown that's the other thing is i was very intentional about living downtown i didn't want to live out in the suburbs not that there's anything wrong with that but i wanted to meet the people in the city i think the blazers can be the team of the city so i want to live in the city and uh, we're living downtown in a loft. We've never done that before. Always kind of had the house, raising kids out in the suburbs. So I'm enjoying downtown life, um, walking my dog each night when my wife's not in town and just in, enjoying a kind of a new empty nesting style of life. Well, I've got a place for you real quick. And, uh, not, <laughs> not gonna try to sell him a no, spot. no, no, no. So there's a place called Good Dog. Have you been yet? I haven't. Okay. So I've got a Vishla. And so okay. I love to take Lady Bird to Good Dog, but it's downtown. So you can actually walk there, and it's just a cool indoor-outdoor facility. So you can just sit back, well, watch TV. Is that the one right underneath the like the overpass of 24th Street? It's it's between yeah, so it's off of 23rd. So I guess that's it. Okay, no, I have been there. Okay. I, I didn't know that was what it was yeah. called, but I have been there. Oh yeah, my Nala is a uh, Rhodesian pit mix that uh, my young my middle daughter, sorry, found outside a crack house in Louisville. Believe it or not. Um, and then I took her on when I was in Nashville coaching when I was living by myself. So, uh, she lives with me. She's my baby. We've had lots of dogs in our, in our lifetime, but Nala's my, uh, everybody at the office will tell you she's my baby. She comes into work with me every day. So you, your daughter found the dog outside of a crack house. Yeah. Louisville. Driving home. There's this weird path that she would have to drive through. And there was this one block of a really bad neighborhood. And as they were going through, they always went through pretty fast. They saw this little puppy almost <laughs> ran her over. Picked her up, went out, did the, hey, does she have a chip? Went to put signs up in the neighboring neighborhoods and uh, or the near neighborhoods, and nobody ever bit. So she brought her down to Nashville to visit me one weekend, and I fell in love with her when she was a puppy and took her on the spot. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a cool story. Yeah. Uh, Coach Trent Dilfer is with us. We're bringing uh, Taylor, our social media director, is bringing you some black coffee oh, thanks, there. Taylor. Yeah, there you go. She make it just like you like it? Uh, black. I love it. It's yes. <laughs> so easy. Yeah. How many cups I, a day? You know, I've got better as I get older. Um, I've had less, probably four or five is all. There was a time when it was a couple pots a day. Wow. Right? Yeah. A couple pots a day. Yeah. All right, take a big, deep draw of that. I'm going to tell everybody, uh, as they know, when we have on UAB guests, they're always presented by the official credit union of uh, the UAB Blazers. That is Legacy Community Federal Credit Union. And right now, they've got that swap and drop. It can be used for auto loans or other recreational vehicles. Swap over to Legacy and drop your rate there. Uh, nine branches of the Greater Birmingham area are online, LegacyCreditUnion.com. Also, lifestyle loans, no collateral required, affordable low rates, uh, update the backyard, go on dream vacation, medical expenses, whatever. Right there at Legacy Community Federal Credit Union, the official credit union of UAB. Uh, this might be the first piece of UAB clothing. I was just making an observation when Coach sat down. The first piece of UAB clothing that I have seen that's got the American logo on it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, that's, huh? uh, I, yeah, it is. I mean, that I... I don't guess I have seen another piece of clothing, so you're the first. Yeah, so Cole Peterson, our DFO, uh, is a swag guy. Right. Um, I, I like it. You know, I mean, I've always been oh, I love into it, yeah. swag. 
Uh, but I've kind of, I got enough on my plate. I kind of turned over the swag to Ryan and Cole this year. And, uh, every day we're finding new pieces and everything's got the American logo on it. Our players love it. Our coaches love it. So, um, it, it's been fun. It's, it's been, we'll talk about the American, but just the overall, uh, rebranding, so to speak. Right. Um, remodeling of the program is, is how I'm saying it ha- has been a challenge, but been a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, normally th- this was unusual circumstances that mm-hmm. this was a job opening. Normally when it's a job opening, a coach is either done well enough, he's taken another job, mm-hmm. or a coach has done poorly enough, he's gotten fired. I mean, it's pretty rare that you follow as good a job as Coach Vincent did, really. It's mm-hmm. a team that Bill Clark built, and he built a really good team. I mean, that's kind of a rare opportunity. They did. It's been um, – I-, I think some people think I'm just like uh, – speaking hyperbole all the time about what a great job Bill did and what Bryant did last year considering the circumstances, but uh, it's, they really left a strong foundation. You, you know, you have, and it's not my perspective. I think a lot of times as I'm doing these interviews, I'm probably the person you shouldn't listen to, right? I'm the high school football coach. You should listen to my guys that came from Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina and Ohio state and, you know, pretty accomplished coaches. And then they all walked in the building and were like, Oh, okay. Like, we got something to build around here. Like, Bill, obviously, everybody knew who Bill Clark was and, you know, a defensive mastermind and a great builder of programs. And um, what he had left uh, is pretty tremendous. Um, You know, a lot of times you go into a program and you want to put your own flavor on it and, you know, the old Parsillian method, which he told me to do the same thing. You fire everybody, blow it up, and make it your own. And that just would have been ignorant because there was so much good here. Um, so from staff, you know, we kept some staff members that are great coaches, great developers. Uh, we kept auxiliary staff people that have done a really nice job. Uh, the building was in place. Uh, and the kids, you know, there, there was a foundation of work ethic. There was a foundation of toughness. Uh, there was a foundation of buy-in to a greater good. Uh, that usually, that's the first year. You know, the first year of building something is establishing your core values, making sure people are thinking the right thoughts, making sure they're uh, in line, all moving the same direction. And and we started that process, and I'm like, huh, they're kind of already doing it. Like, a lot of my core values had been Bill's, had been Bryant. So these kids had been introduced to them and, and actually were buying into something bigger than themselves. So, um, again, that's what I'm saying, the remodel. You know, it's just it just needs some tweaking. It needs some remodeling. It needs some honing. Um and I think we have a chance to be pretty darn good. You know, obviously, if, you know, if a guy gets an opportunity to go from the high school level to Division One, especially in the American, everybody's going to take that. But you didn't necessarily need to take it. Yeah. Um, what led you to UAB? I know you're a spiritual guy, but mm-hmm. were, were, there, were there influences that told you you needed to take this job? Yeah, there was. Um, you know, my wife mainly uh, – you know, we loved what we were doing. And, and again, I don't want this to sound funny, but we didn't need to coach it in Nashville. We didn't need to coach here. We, we kind of, I was very fortunate, had a long career in the NFL, had a long post career in TV, really didn't. I had retired uh, in Texas and, and really never had to work another day in my life and um, was able, really felt called into coaching and felt like we had something really important to do in Nashville that was more than coaching a football team. And and I, I wanted to keep doing it because I think the competitive side of me said, you know, we just built the best team in the history of Tennessee high school football. And I don't think that's really arguable uh, with what we did in a short amount of time. Um, but I want to keep going. Like, I was like, well, let's win six, seven, eight. Let's not lose a game for eight years. How cool would that be? <laughs> like, let's have the longest winning streak. And I'm, these are the conversations around the But the, the opposing building. schools loved you, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. and, my, and my wife one night sits down and goes, what more can you guys do? Like, is winning why we did this? Or, like, did you accomplish what you felt like you were called to, called to accomplish? And, and I'm like, honestly, yes. And, and she's like, well, you know, somebody else – Another program should experience this, should experience not what you do, Trent. She wasn't blowing smoke up my butt. Um, she's my harshest critic, but just my team of people and how we roll and the influence we have on kids. And she's like, you know, somebody else should experience this, and you need another challenge. Like this this past year, not that I was bored, but, you know, we knew we were going to beat people by 40, 50, and we're, we're in the state championship game, and we're like, you know, how quickly are we going to have a running clock? 
is the conversation wow. before the state championship game. So she was like, you need another hill to climb. Basically, it came down to that. Like, you need another giant mountain peak to, to summit. You need to bring your people in. You need to help not just change a program, but change the community that you're in with how you do things. And she was really the one that got me thinking really hard about uh, going to the next level. It, but you also increase your workload significantly, infinitely. You know, I wouldn't say kids. that. You know, but it's you, interesting. You, well, I would say that because you never had to go on the road recruiting. And but I, they don't let you recruit. The head coach doesn't get to recruit. <laughs> like everybody says, the head coach is the the least travel of any person in the building. Uh, I got to go out. You know, there's a period of time during that high school period where you can go out and recruit, and I did. Man, I was in Mobile. I, w- I was everywhere, um, Florida. So there's a, there's a month stint where you're on the road, but like right now our coach is on the road grinding. I can't leave the building. You know, you can't do anything as that coach. They call it the Saban rule um, because before this rule is <laughs> implemented, I guess Nick would just go dominate this time of year. Yes. And it is accidentally a w- bump into a <laughs> recruit. Well, it is a way of balancing out um, the arms race, the, the economic – um, challenges that a group of five has that a power five doesn't have is, you know, they have the private jet, right? Or a few of them. So if you're this time of year, if you're at, let's, you know, one of the big SEC logo schools, like you can jump in the jet and you hit a bunch of schools where we don't have that luxury. So it'd be a huge disadvantage what Coach Dilfer could go see and go interact with and what, you know, SEC coach could go interact with this time of year. So it's probably a good rule. It puts our assistants, the burden on them. Uh, it's why you hire recruiters, not just great coaches. Um, but no, I, I'm not any busier. I'm really not. That's I, interesting. I, I yeah. mean, I, I, in fact, there's an argument that I will work less hours because I have to uh, at this level than I did in high school. You can't remember, I had fifth grade through 12th grade. I had three sport athletes who are juggling schedules. Um, we took on the academic mentoring of our team. Like you wore every hat, you know, the nutritional component. I'm meeting with nutritionists, strength coaches all the time and educating them. They're not educating me. Uh, Like when you build a high school program the way we built it, which was like a power five program, you did everything. I wore every hat. Uh, Parents could get a hold of me up till 10 o'clock at night and sometimes after. Uh, You're dealing with, you know, every issue that was a kitchen table issue to that family became the biggest issue to you as the coach because that kid mattered. You had 170 from fifth grade to 12th grade, and everyone mattered the same. Every parent mattered the same, whether they're Johnny and he can't catch a ball or whether he's Edwin, who's one of the top recruits in the country. It's like they all mattered the same. So I was endlessly busy. I didn't have vacation time. I'd take a big chunk of vacation after the state game. Um, but my summers, I didn't have any vacation time. Now they kick you out of the office. Like there's just there's dead periods. There's times you can't do anything with your players. So I think at the the net of a 365 day calendar, I bet you I'll work less hours. Not because I want to, because I have to. That blows me away. It really no, does. No. I mean, no. because. But but here's the thing. Like, the truth of the matter is, you probably had built a program that you didn't have to do that. To no, keep no, winning. we didn't have to do that. But you're no. not wired that way. Yeah, I only know one way, and and people yeah. that know me, I, you know, I hate talking about myself, but people that know me will tell you that I only know one way. I've always been that way. Um, you know, one of the reasons I didn't coach when the girls were young, for those who don't know, I have three daughters, um, was because I didn't want to be a bad dad. And I'd only seen a couple coaches in my playing career, my TV career, that had done it right with daughters. Now, with sons, a lot of coaches do it great because they can be around the building. They can go to work with dad. They can interact with the players. Like, the the facility kind of becomes an extension of the household for a boy. But for a girl, you can't do that in football. So... I knew and my wife knew that I went into coach. I remember turning down the assistant GM job of the 49ers, and I turned down a couple of NFL jobs right when I was done playing. And it was hard because my heart was in that. But my wife and I both knew that I don't have an off switch. So if I did that, then the family was going to take the brunt of, of that. They were, they were going to be neglected for whatever path I chose. So that's really why I went to TV because it gave me flexibility to stay in the game a little bit which became a lot, um, but still be an active dad and read 
you know, bedtime stories and cook dinner and do laundry and take them to stuff and go to their ball games and uh, kind of co-parent with my wife, which was one of the best, you know, nine year stints of my life while they're in those impressionable years. You know, it was just a, a, a few years ago where college football was pretty predictable. We've mm-hmm. got parity now. Uh, yeah. It was just a little over a decade ago, TCU was a group five team. Two years ago, and they played for a national championship this year. Two years ago, Cincinnati was in the college football playoff as a group mm-hmm. five from your league now, the American. Uh, your, your wife said you need a new hill to climb. <laughs> I mean, UAB with the facilities now, I mean, they've got an incredible stadium. Um, what has been put there over the last decade, you, you didn't see. Maybe you've seen pictures. We, we, we lived it. We mm-hmm. saw it. UAB now has an opportunity maybe to be a Cincinnati, a Boise State, one of these group fives? Well, that's the expectation. I mean, everybody says it, though. And I, I think this is the thing I've learned in college football. It's really easy to say stuff. ADs say it. Presidents say it. Fans say it. Radio guys say it. TV guys say it. It's really easy to throw that out there because you've seen a couple teams do it. The path from saying it to doing it is exponentially harder, I think, than people realize. Um, we're living it right now in the portal, uh, world, um, where <clears throat> we have a great group of kids that want to be here. Um, but it's foolishness to think that the heavy, the big pocket schools aren't enticing our kids to try to come and be part of their programs. Um, and, and arms race isn't the right way to say it. It's an economic mismatch. Right. When when now you have free agency in college football without guardrails, um, at least in free agency in the NFL, there's a period of time. Right. There's there's the NFL office that has dozens of people monitoring um, what goes on behind the scenes, um, regulating what goes on behind the scenes. College football is the wild freaking West now. Like, it is free agency with no guardrails, with no regulation, um, and it's going to be very difficult for our level of football to compete with the big boys when you have 16, 17, 18, 25, 30 million dollar gaps. Now, do we use that as a reason not to win? No. We expect to go to Athens week four and compete with the national champions. Like, that's the standard and expectation in our building. But again, I want people to understand the realities of it. You know, you're dealing with um, a massive chasm um, between the economic ability of a group of five school uh, and, a, and a power five school. And, and there's challenges around that. Now, I love those challenges. Uh, our building knows this. Yesterday, they all heard it relentlessly um, that we're using this as opportunity, um, that we're looking at challenges as opportunity, that we like hard things, that we like to be uncomfortable. That's going to bring, bring the best out in us. But again, as you see these kids, because I'm sure you guys are talking about Portal right now, as you see these kids leaving programs going, oh, wow, UAB should get on them. I'd be like, yeah, can you float me 100 grand? <laughs> you know, can you, can you float the collective 100 grand? Because that's that kid's going price right now. Yeah. You know, kid leaves school X in the power of five and he hits the portal and it goes, yes. Oh, coach Dilfer, you know, they should get on him. And I'm behind my scenes, we're watching, you know, that's all we do all day is watch tape and we're sitting there watching tape going, okay, what's his price tag? What's his price tag? What's his price tag? And they won't even talk to you if you don't they, have it, right? They won't even talk to you. So you're looking for the right kind of kid that's motivated by the right things. Uh, and that, that sounds great. Um, but they're hard to find, but when you find them, and this is the silver lining, when you find them and we have them on our team, when you find them, they're playing for something bigger than a price tag. They're playing for something bigger than um, their brand. They're playing for the university. They're playing for their teammates. They're playing for something bigger. And, and I'm a believer because I want a Super Bowl doing this, that when you get a group of people that have bought into something bigger than themselves, that are selfless, that want to serve one another, um, that want to sacrifice for one another, um, you're tough to beat. And then you add great coaches on that with great scheme, um, the ability to make teams eat their soup left-handed, and, and you got a chance to win. I guess my overall point is that it's really easy to say it. And I've seen a lot of um, people in higher ed <laughs> and powerful positions say it. Uh, they have no idea how hard it is to actually do it. 
We're going to do one more segment with Coach Dilfer, Trent Dilfer, UAB football with us in studio for one more segment. Lance got a list for him. We like to do a list with guests. I like lists. Yeah, we're going to run a list to get to know Coach a little bit better. We continue on the next round. Coach Trent Dilfer in studio with us for about 10, 15 more minutes. As always, uh, UAB guests appear on this show courtesy of Legacy Community Federal Credit Union, LegacyCreditUnion.com. If you're watching us on any of our video platforms, just scan that QR code in your top right corner there and learn more about Legacy. Anytime we have a guest on, especially ones that we uh, we don't know as well, though we, we know who Coach Dilfer is, we like to learn a little bit more yeah, about him. The, the way we do that, Coach, is with a list. We've, we've done it with tons of people, and we always learn something. Yeah, I've got a list, but I want to ask you first. You were the, uh, the motivation of former Colts general manager Bill Tobin yep. calling out Mel Kuyper. Yep. Did so, you realize that, Brown? Yeah, I, I, I did not until I, I had to do something on that recently, and I looked back, and I'd forgotten who the argument was about. <laughs> it was about. It was about Trent Dillon. Well, I feel bad for Bill. The story, I've told this on ESPN, but the story behind that is that my agent would not let me play for the Colts. And we told them, remember, that was the year before expansion, and the Panthers had the first pick of the next year, and Pullian loved me, and they had already told me if I sit out the year, I'd be the first pick the following year. So we use that as leverage to have the Colts not pick us. Now, as a dumb thing in retrospect, because I could have played with Marshall Falk, uh, who was a friend in college, guy I've competed against. But for whatever reason, my agents thought the Colts were the worst uh, franchise in the NFL, was adam about, adamant about me not playing there. So we use that as leverage. So Bill got stuck. They couldn't draft me. So when they passed up on me, <laughs> he gets looking. he looks like an idiot. They were trying to draft me. And the Kuiper thing happened, and to this day I feel bad for Bill Tobin. Yeah, uh, because Kuiper comes right back on and says, the one thing the Colts need is quarterback, and there's Trent Dilver right there, and they pass on And he basically said the Colts – this is why the Colts are the Colts. That's right, yeah. And uh, and then that was Tobin that said my – Mel my, man. My Mel <laughs> no, <it's more laughs> than Mel. Who the hell is Mel yeah. Kuiper? But I, I tell you what, though, Mel Kuiper well, – first of all, now, Mel's still going. I don't know – Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I worked going. with him for nine years, and we did those draft shows together. Yeah. We did – these on the clock segments. He's a machine. Yeah, he, he preps is. more than anyone. He is a machine. I have always heard though, the nicest guy. He's great. Like because I think you watch him on TV and he's a really big personality. Oh, he's an awesome human. Yeah, but I've heard he is an extreme. Everybody I've ever talked to any dealings with yeah. him tell you just what a salt of the earth guy he is. Great human. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Hit me. Gladiator or Braveheart? Gladiator. Uh, peanut butter jelly or grilled cheese? Ooh. That's tough. Ooh, that's tough. Well, you went gladiator quick, too. I'll go PB and J. Yeah. Uh, LeBron or Jordan? Jordan. Uh, playoff hockey or playoff basketball? Basketball. <laughs> uh, better former Packer quarterback, Farver Rogers. Mm. I actually think Brett's one of the most underrated players in the history. I'm going to go Brett. I watched the three MVPs up close and personal. They're smoking us in Tampa. Um, I love them both. I, that's the qualifier, but I'll go with Brett. Yeah, well, I mean, Brett to me was, and, and this might not be fair to Aaron Rodgers, just seemed like more of the competitor and He's, just loved the game. And he was transformational. Like, he changed the position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. changed the way the guys played the position. You wouldn't have Patrick Mahomes if you didn't have Brett Favre. Where, where, where will you stack right now the AFC East? If Tua stays healthy with the, with the Dolphins, we saw how good that offense can be. Obviously, Josh Allen and the Bills – you know, they are one of the best teams in the NFL. But now when you put Rodgers with the Jets, where are they in the pecking order of the AFC? Well, I think the interesting thing is you can make an argument this first time the Patriots will be the least talented yeah. team in the division. Yeah. yeah, we were just talking uh, about I don't that. want to say the worst because I would never bet against Bill, but uh, they're the least talented. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting if Aaron can play Sela's way of playing. You know, that's going to be a defensive-centric deal and Aaron wants to play aggressively offensively so I'm not sure if it's the best fit I, I'm, I'm in wait and see mode if this is the best fit uh, best player you've ever played with or against so this is a tough one I, I think I played with 12 Hall of Famers I know Ray Lewis was one of those guys yeah I would actually go Walter Jones Wow. Ray Sap kind of all tied for one, if I had to pick one, I would say Ray. 
But Walter Jones it made the game look easier than anybody is, I've ever seen. Is he maybe the most underrated offensive lineman of all time? Oh, he's the best offensive lineman of all time. Yeah. And, and the other yeah. offensive lineman will tell you that. Like, well, you know, he's an Alabama guy. I know. Guy. I was about yeah. to say, Coach has been here long enough. He's like, I got to me a state Alabama Listen, guy, Walter Jones. Ogden would tell you that. I, all the Hall of Fame offensive Orlando linemen, Pace. they would all tell you yeah. that Walter is the best of all time. Um, he just made – I saw him brought, block Bruce Smith – for an entire game and we had those seattle seahawk like weird blue jerseys that when you sweat just a little bit changed blue and we're in the locker room after the game we're all taking off our stuff and the switch sweats dropping dripping off of us and i look at walter i'm like dude you didn't sweat and he goes no i didn't sweat today he didn't sweat for 68 plays blocking bruce smith well, like, he was the guy that was pushing that, and escalating that, in the off season. that's how good he is best against you know you have reggie uh, Derek Thomas, Dion would kind of be, you know, Prime. Prime was really good, man. I know he gets all the attention now for what a great coach he is when he's doing in Colorado, but Prime, Prime was like Walter. He just made the game look super simple. Reggie White was unblockable. Did you even look to Prime's his third? I in the was field? dumb enough. My rookie year, my first start in '94 was in Candlestick against him and I tried to throw a post route against me baited me played like two bodies underneath the post <laughs> route so I thought it was open and I went to lay it out there and he passed my receiver while the ball was in the air and picked it <laughs> off uh, my first pass as that game was a square out to his side and I wasn't that dumb I was dumb but I wasn't that dumb and I threw the sucker in the bleachers <laughs> like I, I wasn't about to try to throw a throw a square out on him so yeah i played against some great ones i didn't get to play against lt i saw him on film and crossover at the end of his career but i did not play against him um man there's a lot of them i, I played against in my generation of you know the the era i played in the defensive players were some of the greatest of all time uh phil sims tells a story that uh, bill, one of the biggest chewings he ever got from bill parcells was they were playing the redskins and he's like i don't care what you see mm -hmm. you do not throw at daryl green yeah, whatever side of the field he's on, you do not throw. And then Phil Simms is like, I get flushed one time. I'm rolling to my left on green side. I got a wide open receiver, complete it for a first down. I'm clapping, headed back to the huddle, and Parcells is out at the numbers, cussing me out because I threw it on that side. Uh, one, of, I threw 117 interceptions in NFL, which I'm not proud about, but I remember each one. The one that still keeps me up at night. We're playing the Redskins on a Sunday night. Um, and we're marching down to beat them, and we have a deep in cut to the left, and a, you know, kind of clear in the middle, and then a high low, and Daryl's over there, and I, the window's perfect. I make a perfect like low inside throw where they would say only your guy can get it, and somehow Daryl got out in front of it and like scooped it off the ground to beat us, and that one still eats at me because. I made the perfect read. I made the perfect throw, and it's the wrong matchup. Like the wrong guys running the route, and the right guys covering it. <laughs> uh, better Fresno quarterback, Derek or David Carr? David was a better college player. Yeah, David was a much better college player. Uh, Derek's become the best of all of us in the NFL. Um, but man, David in college—that was a trim. And they played good people. They like, did. That's when Pat they Hill wasn't afraid to play anybody. That's when they'd go play anybody anywhere and. Uh, David had a tremendous uh, college career. There's he, a reason he was the first pick of the draft. Yeah. Did it, was, it, was it legit? Like the, what they said about him in Houston was he just got pressured so much he lost his mechanics. Is that what happened? Yeah. It's like 48 times his yeah. first yeah. season. They... Yes. I mean, so did a lot of us. So I, I don't want to use it as a total. They didn't surround him with very good people. He got beat up. Um, and I, I do think, and David would probably tell you this, I think there is a – at some point, you're on the bottom, right? I think a lot of us go through that, and some people at that moment can pull themselves up and fight through all the crap and, you know, carve away. And then some guys like, you know, this isn't for me. I'm not willing to do that. And I think David just wasn't willing to, to pull himself out of the muck. Uh, better 80s movie, Breakfast Club or Back to the Future? Breakfast Club. First concert you ever attended? Beach Boys, Candlestick Park. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Lots of stuff happened at Candlestick Park. I'm Candlestick old. Park. Huh? I'm that old. I heard yeah, Candlestick you're not that old. That's I heard what I was 51. Say. Yeah, I mean, but I'm, you're not that yeah, old. I mean, I know you're a Northern California guy, but yeah. I heard Candlestick was just a dump. Probably great memories yeah. for you. But. Yeah, Candlestick was a dump. AT&T was awesome. at and yeah. awesome. Um, spent a lot of time at both ballparks. Big uh -huh. Was a big baseball w fan. Was that a good concert, though, the Beach Boys? I mean, I, you know, I was 12 years old or whatever, yeah. so I don't remember a ton of it. But uh, So your parents drug you? Parents took me. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it was. I mean, it was fun. I remember listening to them for like junior high years. I thought it was cool listening to the Beach Boys until <laughs> one of my friends told me I was a dork. <laughs> uh, first car you ever had? A 1971 Ford Maverick. Thing weighed about 9,000 pounds, I bet. So you would have gotten your driver's license, what, 88? Is that right? That'd Sounds be the right. math right? Yep. 88? 88, yep. And your first car was a 71. 71 huh? Ford Maverick cost, I think, 2,800 bucks. Yeah. I, I worked at a gas station to earn half of it, and my parents put up the other half, and then they paid for the insurance, and I paid for the gas. <laughs> I bet that thing and that sucker gas, went through some yeah, gas. That was regular <laughs> gas, by the way, for those who don't remember <laughs> rotary phones and regular gas. Uh, <laughs> finally, most influential coach you've ever played for? No, that's hard. It's a tie. I'll say this because I'll use life. Clyde Christensen. Um, Clyde Christensen, I was, you know, unfortunately, after he coached me, he had to go coach Peyton and Tom Brady and Andrew Luck. <laughs> so he had a real downside to his career after he coached me. But um, he was my quarterback coach in Tampa. Um, but more than that, he's my football hero. Uh, he taught me a lot of football. Um, but he was my football hero. Like he did it right. A lot of how I coach is around how Clyde coached me. Um, the way I run a building is a lot how Clyde led, but mainly how I parent is how Clyde parented. You know, he had three girls. He, he's the one man I saw do it great, not good, great as a professional coach and a father and as a husband. And, and I didn't ever want to sacrifice one for the other. And uh, I learned that from Clyde. He, he, to this day, in fact, he just took a, an analyst role uh, with Mac Brown in North Carolina as he left the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, when Tom left, he left. So um, he's had, I, again, you in the private football circles, when you mention the name Clyde Christensen, I think everybody that he's touched will say that's the best man and the best coach that ever coached. Wow. Yeah. August 31, North Carolina A&T Protective Stadium is when UAB starts uh, the Trent Dilfer era on the field there. If I could make it tomorrow or sell you 100 more days, which one would you do? Oh, gosh. We need the 100 more days. Okay, I'll sell you 100 more <laughs> days. I think we all do. Yeah. I, listen, we're, we've made big strides. We feel really good about where we're at. But uh, the way we run a program, um, these are professional standards. And I think our kids still need the summer months and fall camp to truly understand the level of football that we're trying to play. Uh, we want you to be at the ball game. Obviously, if you're not watching on TV, we want to show you a product that if you turn on Sunday football would look pretty, pretty much exactly the same. Uh, our level of complexity, execution, expectation for our kids uh, is a Sunday expectation on and off the field. So uh, that takes time. That takes, uh, again, it's easy to say hard to do. So uh, we got a lot of work still to do. You know, it's kind of ironic. Uh, Jacob Zeno, your quarterback, mm -hmm. was an Elite 11 guy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, did you guys build a How much time do we have? It's we, uh, we own it. Yeah, All right, we you own it. Go right, as far so, as you go. Uh, so, Zeno was a not just an Elite 11 guy. I went back to my notes. Uh, you know, I took tons of notes back in those days. And um, I went back to that year's notes. And when I got here to kind of see what my evaluation is, you know, was the time. And he was one of my favorite guys. Like there was something to him. What I put was this kid's made of the right stuff, talented, um, very accurate, smart, but made of the right stuff. Like he is wired the right way. Uh, and that's the best thing I'll say about Jacob Zeno. He had a very good spring. He's a very talented player. He'll be even better after the summer months working uh, in fall camp. But the best thing about him is that you can trust him, right? You could trust him taking your daughter on a date. You could trust him, you know, doing an errand for you. You could trust him to go to class. You could trust him to handle locker room right. You can trust him with the offense. Like, he is wired the right way. And there, people ask me this time of year, the draft stuff. Like, when I was doing the draft, I didn't miss a lot. And it wasn't on the traits that I saw. It wasn't necessarily on the tape. It was an experience with these kids in a young age, knowing if they could handle the rigors of what playing quarterback is in the NFL. Well, that has now become college football. It, the rigors of playing college football as a quarterback are brutal. You're expected to be a co-offensive coordinator. You, you carry a larger burden than everybody else. So you got to make sure they are wired the right way. You got to make sure they're going to handle success well, failure well, um, all the different circumstances that come up in the course of an off season and a season. And that's the thing I'm most proud of Jacob about is the guy has not flinched 
since the time we, we stepped on campus, and we have challenged him in a way he's never been challenged before. Uh, and again, he's just got that no flinch mentality to him. Oh, great story there. And you can see Jacob Zeno and all the UAB coming up August 31, Protective Stadium. Coach, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. I'll do it again. Absolutely. We'll, we'll take you up on that. As always, our guest from UAB presented by Legacy Credit Union. Scan that QR code in the top right corner if you're watching us on video and find out more about Legacy.